Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of the General Gaming Show. I am Bridger, or should I say Caius Marius Brigarius. And I am joined here today by Great. What's your Latin name, Great? Lucius, obviously. There you go. But I don't know the other two. Okay. Yeah. I just made mine up. I don't know that Caius Marius has anything to do with Adam Ruzzo. But sure. It sounded like it. it went well with Brigarius. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, welcome to the General Gaming Show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we don't have titles, because I was too lazy to put them on there, or and or forgot. But today we're talking all about Rome 2, so let's jump right into it. I don't even, I, I, like, we normally have this segment, we're like, what have you been playing this week? Well, I've been playing this, what have you been playing this week? The answer is Rome 2, alright? That's the answer. We were looking at our things and we were comparing, and I am apparently the champion with 43 hours played already. And I feel a little bad about that. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't know if I should feel good about that. I don't I mean it, there's just something that draws me in. That yeah. like I can't stop playing it. Yet yeah, then I then afterwards I kinda like sink into this depression of like why am I still playing this? It, yeah, it really is. It's like I just I just wanna I just wanna conquer Carthage. That's all. Car Carthage is gone in my game as, as Actually, a yeah. The, I've played two campaigns up to about at least 100 turns in, and in both of them, Carthage got destroyed by other African nations, or city-states, or whatever they are down there. Uh, so, let's start just talking about it, because we've been chomping at the bit <laughs> all day. What were your initial impressions upon playing it? I mean, it's got this weird new UI with some crazy-looking stuff. But uh, what were your initial impressions? I would say out the gate, I was kind of entertained because I, I did the prologue first, something I usually don't do in Total War games because I've been playing them for ever. <laughs> and uh, I found the prologue actually kind of entertaining. Like, I kind of introduced you to a lot of the sort of uh, newer mechanics a little bit, and then it just kind of threw you in there. And then that's when I kind of ran into my, my biggest issues where, like, I ran into a ton of issues... Um, just in the prologue with just like performance things and overall though outside of the game it's like it's sort of disappointment i would say at some level um that and we're probably going to talk more about why i think that but it's it's just like there's something this game could have done and there are things this game should have learned from other games in the series that Creative Assembly has been making for like 10 years now, over 10 years. <laughs> right. And it feels like they just like dropped everything and just tried to make something from scratch in a lot of ways, and it just didn't work. Everything feels like it, 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 there just wasn't any testing done, there wasn't any iteration done, that they scrapped some things that have worked for the series for so long, and they've just gone with a sort of very new sort of like, I don't want to say casual, because that's not, not what it is, but like this very like mainstream or streamlined approach to things. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've been trying to play around in my head, because let's, let's get the elephant in the room out there. <clears throat> the game has a lot of problems, and a oh. lot of people have been voicing them in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different forums, to the point where on every single forum I went to, from Reddit to the official forums, to TW Center, to the Steam forums, there was at least one thread trying to organize a class action lawsuit against Sega and, <laughs> and uh, uh, Creative Assembly. And, man, wouldn't it be nice to live in a world where you could sue a company for selling you a bad game? <laughs> oh, yeah. It, I think that's what, like, rustles me the most about this, is that this is the first game I pre-purchased in maybe, like, two years. Mm -hmm. No, a year, since, like, Guild Wars 2. And it has terribly let me down yeah and i think and i think they, they also uh what was it they announced like this is the most game we've ever had you know pre-order sales for it's terrible because we all got an unfinished product yeah it's just... other people are saying they lied to us they said it was going to be like this they showed us this alpha footage from months ago and now things are way worse even though they said back then there was only going to get better and yeah, so anyway, that if you oh, want to go and read those complaints, there's so many of them. We don't want to just rehash those, because the game yeah. does have its flaws. Uh, but I think what's more interesting is to try to discover what, what the cause of the flaws are. Now, in my experience going through the game and trying to figure out what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it, I did have some 
FPS issues, which I really didn't expect because I just finished upgrading to the bleeding edge processor and video card, and I've got 8 gigs of RAM. I should not have... I should have zero problems running this game on medium, on, on like extreme, much less on, you know, ultra, very high, or high. But I still do have problems. It's not super noticeable, but it's definitely there. And by that and many other people who have systems that are, you know, not as good as mine, but well past the recommended specs, having even worse problems, it's very clear this game was not optimized correctly. Uh, and a lot of people have been pointing that out in various re ways. And I think that this thread on Reddit kind of shows more so than anything else. Uh, somebody found that for certain people, not for me and not for people with i7s as far as I can tell, but for some people, if you open the game, go into your uh, task manager, you can usually control alt delete right-click on the Roam 2 task. It should have your four, four cores or eight cores or whatever. If you deactivate one of those cores, hit OK, and then open it up again and reactivate the core and hit OK, the game runs way smoother for some people. That's a weird thing to have to... I've actually... What does I've that actually, mean? I've done that because I, I, I think I linked you pictures. I wish I had that picture still of... I read this like sort of trick that people are doing with the affinities and going into processes, and I've actually done that. And, and apparently, I have a i5, so I have four processors and mm -hmm. like four four threads. So one of my processors was at 100%. Like the graph was maxed out, like constantly bricked up, mm -hmm. where the other ones were sitting at around 70. And so I did this, and it kind of it put the load on the other three processors a little bit more. But over time, I noticed as I put like 30 or plus more minutes into the game it all happened again. So it would go back and like start bottlenecking at 100 and then I would have huh. like those weird FPS tips. So it's, it's the game engine. Like at the end of the day, it's the game engine. You can do small tricks to alleviate it, but it's just, uh, it's so frustrating that it, it's, it's not anywhere near like what a final product should kind of be at. Yeah, as I, as I played it, I thought maybe these were just, you know, a failure to beta test on enough systems of different varieties, or at first they were blaming it on the drivers. And, I, you know, a lot of times a game will come out and drivers will come out a few days later from NVIDIA and a AMD, and it'll fix a huge chunk. Like, you'll, you'll see the drivers... Uh, what do they have them in the, in the notes on the drivers? It'll say improves performance in game X by 70%. Like that's a massive performance increase because you have, you know, a lot of new stuff being tried in the bleeding edge games with regards to graphics and the drivers don't necessarily know how to handle it yet. And so that gets sort of fixed over time, but then it starts going beyond just the technical issues and you start looking at things in the game where the AI is messing up or where there are blatant problems that should have been come up in, in, in playtesting. The one that sticks out to me that was just like the, the, the really, really moment was when my ally tried to help me by blockading a Syracuse which I was trying to take over and they did that for 20 turns, and the game doesn't let you attack something that's being blockaded by one of your allies. What? Oh, yeah, I've, I've had that happen. That happened uh, twice so in my first campaign. Twice in my first campaign and once in my second campaign. That means that they had to test this game so little, or they didn't have time to fix that. They might have even known about it. I think that's actually intentional, because you can do assaults by sea now, so it's kind of considered a siege. Right. But that's so, like, they're already breaks. sieging it before you? I had to declare war on my ally to fight the people and take yeah. the city. That's broken. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah it, people, it, people who are watching, I may be a little confused. This is video from the stream I did yesterday that we're overlaying over the, the, the conversation. So that's why when you see me talking <laughs> in the video, it's not going to oh, sync up. <laughs> <laughs> there's a picture of you, I just noticed that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's like weird stuff like that, which is like uncooperative AI, period. Like, they don't want to work with you at mm -hmm. all. And it's, it's sad, but then there's such a good core to this game that we're probably going to talk about. Absolutely. Right now, I guess. Uh, and, and it just, it feels to me, just getting all this out of the way before we actually get into the nitty gritty of it, it feels to me. Like, there are a lot of issues that you can't possibly have missed. 
you cannot possibly have missed all of these issues uh, that people have been talking about, including the AI ones and and the problem. I mean, we've seen the the Angry Joe video, right, where he's got units oh, yeah. that are running right at his lines, and then two seconds before they clash, they <sighs> run away again forever and ever. Those kinds of issues cannot have been missed by their testing department. So it's either A, they did zero testing, or B, they did some testing, knew that there were issues, but they had to release it anyway with the intention of fixing it all later. Um, and so, so let's let's talk a little bit more about um, you, you have you found a post here on the main Total War forums that uh, talks about a lot of the issues that you were having with the game, both mechanically, well, mostly mechanically, not just the technical flaws, but more along the lines of your critique or problems with the game. So, do you want to go over that real quick? Oh yeah, th this poster, uh, I think it's Ray. That's how you pronounce his name. I mean, he kind of sums up everything I have, my sort of design decision issues with Rome Two, coming from my experience with Rome all the way through almost every game except Napoleon I haven't played uh, over the past 10 years or so. And, you know, he goes out things, no family tree, no tight or loose formation. I mean, we're dealing with a game where it's all about sort of like these big masses of units that you don't have a way to sort of um, negate like range damage or keep units more, co you know, together and close. There's no guard order for units. Testudo and Phalanx are not working right now. <laughs> Testudo? I've tested it. Testudo with Praetorian Guards, the best Roman infantry in the game, actually sucks against Slingers. They will die quicker in Testudo <laughs> than they will when they just all-out charge against Slingers. I was so upset when that happened. It is it is insane. Yeah. That's But that's like a bug thing. Like, we're talking about, you know, testing. Yeah, it's... Um, it's it's again. It's either they didn't they didn't test the game, which I think they must have had testing going on the entire time, or they they just put it out anyway. So we don't know. We we don't really want to speculate on why in Sega, but um, <laughs> let's let's keep going. So there's My no toggle one. fire at will uh, on infantry with javelins. That's an interesting one. I don't remember that being like. I remember having like the the pile. I think they're called that the Romans the pila. Uh, the pila. Yeah. pila. Uh, I don't remember you being able to tell them to just fire the Pila. Um, there actually was in, in Rome. Rome. There was? Okay. Yeah, you could, all the legionaries, so basically Histadi, Principes, and then the, co the cohorts after the Marian mm -hmm. upgrades, uh, they all had a fire at will toggle on off you could, you could have. So they could stand there and like throw their javelins without actually having to charge. Now, charging a unit and the Pila throw and the javelin throws from other units in the game that can do it are all tied to charging. So, like, you can't have them stand there and kind of, like, defensively throw the javelins or the pila, which kind of sucks because, like, that was kind of a great way to break kind of charges that were coming at you in a lot of ways. Oh, to counter throw with your own javelins. Ah. Yeah, yeah and sense. also cavalry. Like, when they charge you, you need to brace. You can't charge cavalry. That's the worst thing to do. And so what you would do is you would have this fire at will where they could throw Pila and that whole first line of cavalry would get hit and probably die. Yeah. But now you have to countercharge cavalry to get the Pila throw, which is just silly. You never yeah. want to charge cavalry. That's just, what? completely counterintuitive. I mean, it's nice that they do it automatically and they don't, you know, the engine is definitely, is, is, it's a whole new engine compared to what Rome was on. So mm -hmm. it's nice that they can do this great ch ch cinematic, like, charge throw and then run in there. It's cool looking, but gameplay kind of wise it's a wonky decision why they just don't let us toggle fire at will um he the next one he points out the inappropriate context based behavior is the is great because i've had this happen so many times have you seen like your units will get in like their skirmish or their fight and then like they'll be retreating and there's still enemies all around them but they start cheering have you seen that <laughs> i have not seen that <laughs> oh <laughs> They're getting charged by horses, and people are routing all around them. They're like, yeah, we got them! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like their friends are dying on the battlefield, and they're like, yeah, woo, we did it, woo, Rome! And it's the most hilarious, it's just like, why? Like, what, why? It just doesn't make any sense to us on a lot of levels. Yeah, so... I mean, I was looking at all of these issues that you're bringing up, and I they, they, they cause issues for me, too. The campaign AI, uh, one turn per year, army limits, all of these things. 
Um, the in-game encyclopedia helps in some ways, but completely fails in other ways. And I think it all comes down to one thing. It comes down to this game being shoved out the door before these features could be implemented. I mean, if you look at the list of here, the no family tree thing, that sounds like a feature that you would cut if you had to put the game out the door. Right? If you're looking at all the features that could be cut, you can't cut diplomacy, you can't cut trade, you can't cut you know, time on the battle AI because it's already bad enough as it is, but you can cut out the family tree without losing too much. You can cut out this loose or tight formation and the game can still function. Like All of these features that are on this list are things that you can cut and not work on if you absolutely positively have to get the game out the door. So that's Funny why... thing about loose tight formation is that that was actually in the early alpha footage. It was there, yeah. and they were using it. Well, then that's, and they cut that's, it out. They made it confusing. It's possible. Yeah. They, I mean, it's it's entirely possible they had something bugged in there, and they didn't have you know the the yeah. the days that it would have taken to find the bug and fix it, and they didn't want to release it in a bugged state because it's possible maybe it would set up so that your principe wouldn't come out of loose formation <laughs> or something. I mean, there could have been bugs that completely screwed things up there. But anyway, so I mean, the game has these issues. I think that we'll see a lot of these, if not the the vast majority of them, get addressed in the coming weeks through patches. Uh, and the only question to me is why? Why would Sega need to shove this out the door knowing that it was incomplete, knowing that they were gonna have to have people working on it anyway? I think it might be because if you're working on a full game for the extra two months, like let's say this, this game was gonna come out at the end of October, for example, um, then you're paying the entire team for the whole two months. This way, they can shift the team over to like DLC content and uh, expansions, or maybe even a whole nother game. Meanwhile, they'll have a tiny little team working on fixing the bugs and doing all this stuff, right? So they, they can, like, they, well, okay, we'll pay for a tiny team that'll fix this stuff. That's fine, who cares? That's about the only reason you'd release it in this shitty condition and get all of this negative press, right? What the hell, what's the other reason? I can't think of it. It, uh, it's weird to describe sort of this like triple a development thinking it's i don't even understand it half the time like why they make certain decisions when it's going to cost them money in the long run and i i, 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 I can tell you 100 percent right now i will not pre-order another sega game 100 percent. i'm not pre-ordering another game i mean I forget. well no, there were there are certain games that i will pre-order from p developers that have a track record with me i will pre-order valve games I used to say I would pre-order Total War games because even though yep. they have been released bad in the past, there was only one game that I felt really annoyed by, and that was Empire. But Empire wasn't bad necessarily by technical failures. It was bad because I didn't like the design of it. But, you know, that could easily be chalked up to... Actually, nobody liked the design of it. But <laughs> anyway, my <laughs> point is Shogun was very well received. The original Total War was a game that I loved. Empire, uh, uh, Medieval and Medieval 2 were both great games. I had a very good feeling that Rome 2 would be a good game, and it probably still will be a good game. But the fact that you burn me like this makes me very upset, <laughs> is, is the thing. Uh, so, like I said, there's very few people that I will pre-order games from at this point. It's pretty much just Valve and... Yeah, pretty much just Valve. I mean... How do I how do I phrase this? It's sort of like we had trust in Creative Assembly, yes. and they kind of lost that trust from a lot of people, and I think that's that's the biggest thing. Um, and it sucks because I wanna I wanna say like they they have a good track record like they've earned my trust. It wasn't like I just gave it to them because I'm a, like oh yeah just whatever. They they've earned this over great great games, and it, it's kind of saddening that it's gonna end in like an instant. Yeah, all right. So, instant, but like one bad release. Let's talk about the actual uh, game. So there, there's okay. a couple of really useful things that people should know. I think I found this, uh, this, this list of um, I don't even know what to call it. It's just uh, uh, it's an imager album with a bunch of information about how to use a lot of the sort of hidden functionality in the combat system. Did you see this? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, so there's a link in the show notes for people that want to check this out. Show notes can be found at the bottom of this video if you're watching on YouTube. Otherwise, the show notes can be found in the Twitch chat if you're reading this on Twitch. There we go. Uh, so here's, here's the different things. So they say um, you can, for example, 
um, use control G to put your units into a uh, formation group. If you use like control one, control two, control three, that will just put them in a selection group. You then would need to select the same units and do control G. That will put them in a formation group so that when you tell them to move or you click and drag, right click, it will keep them in the spacing and formation they had when you chose to hit control G. It will remember that spacing and put them there, which is something I've been looking for for forever because I hated those default formations that they have in the system. Um, and the other thing that they suggest here, uh, if you do control plus right click or control plus right click drag on the ground, they march more orderly and keep the phalanx formations. Um, even if you uh, control and attack, I think they keep the phalanx formations better than if you just right click. Um, they also automatically engage soldiers. If you uh, have these soldiers in formation and you, I believe it's control right click on the enemy, Everybody else in the formation won't just suddenly attack the single guy that you clicked on. They'll all move forward and choose targets in front of them. It's still not quite as good as if you're micromanaging this guy, go after this guy, this guy, after that guy, etc., etc. But uh, it's way better than just telling if you want all your guys to advance and you need to go look at some other part of the battlefield. It's way better to just select a bunch of them and then if they're in the formation that you want, do a quick control G and then right click on somebody in the middle of the enemy group and the whole thing will move forward in formation and they'll attack as a group. Not the best way to do it, but it's still a better way than others. Um, and the other things that I think he mentions on here is alt helps doing something and I don't remember where he talked about that but anyway you can go through the whole thing here there's a lot of information uh, on how this can help you and I was starting to use some of these in my games today and it was working out pretty well so yeah this this is kind of like it's great that someone put all this together and there's lots of helpful tips like people are really trying to make this work and I think that's one of the great things about the community thus far is like there's people not only I'm sure we'll talk about it but like modders are really mm -hmm. trying their best already but also people like this like hey there's a lot of hidden features and stuff in the game that the game doesn't explain to you because whatever yeah <laughs> Uh, here's like I, I was I was blown away because there's nothing that I have found that explained any of how those things work. So that that opened my eyes personally. You uh, think like there'd be an entire mission in the prologue about like here's we have to keep formation against the Samnite forces or something like that. Yeah. You know, hold the men in line and keep them like that is like the that it's it just frustrates me because like that is what Roman like that warfare is all about like this sort of disciplined organized <laughs> unit instead we get this mess of like barbarian mercenaries that got into our hard drive <laughs> yeah, <laughs> somehow in there smash and then they start cheering they just start cheering and then I'm just like all right I'm done all right so let's talk about yeah. all the systems in the game because there's one system in the entire game that I think works really well Aside from the technical flaws, the game looks beautiful. The, the, the campaign map is gorgeous, and the battles themselves look amazing. As long as you have decent frames, the game runs and looks fantastic. I don't think I've found anything visually that I've disagreed with on an aesthetic point of view. I know some people have had gripes here and there. Some people like the grainy filter they had on the on the on the alpha, but that that's been the one that I think the standout. Like, and and that's the one that you think to yourself, like when they said they had a forty percent bigger budget, does that mean that they put it all in the graphics so that it would market better? Like, did Sega manipulate that? Because you know, I mean, can I go on a rant here? Great, go for it. There's so many people getting so pissed off at Creative Assembly. They, they say, you know, they should have known or they did know or this or that. These people are like most game designers and most game designers love the games that they're making. Well, most good game designers. Um, and, and you want to love the game you're making. You want to be proud of it. You want to say, I put my best in here. But I, I am like 100% certain that Creative Assembly feel bad about what they had to release. This is how, I mean, because the craft that went into this game and the previous games in the series shows that these people care, and games that get released to critical acclaim, like, you know, the original Rome and all the other ones, you have to have people that care in order to create something of that quality. So, you know that they feel bad about what had to come out here. And to see people, like, just slamming them on the forums like they demand an apology and they're, they're horrible people and all of these things. I have yet to find a single design decision 
I have really disagreed with in this game. I have found a lot of things in the details, like the length of the battle is a problem, but the the pro like what you can bring to battle and stuff, the balance can be a little bit off, but the design of the game works for me. And and to see everybody stomping all over CA for for what is as far as I can tell, something that's not their, their... I'm assuming it's not their problem. I think we should be hating on the people whose decision it was to release the game early. But anyway, I let's talk more about the system. Great. What do you think about the graphics? <laughs> I think they look phenomenal. And I think, you know, I'm on a little bit of a lesser computer than you. So I'm running... I kind of played around with things to get it where I wanted it. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a solid, like, system that, you know, the engine that they're using, they've worked on for... Oh man, it has to be like six years now since Empire. They've been improving this engine, and, and graphically, it's starting to show like they've really spent a lot of time working on this. But it, it, it's plagued with some issues. I mean, those are issues that can be fanned out in time. Um, I think I like the little details, the very subtle details of it, like when arrows and uh, javelins get stuck in shields. Yeah, I love. Yeah, there's great animation work, even though a lot of people don't see it. There's a lot of really good animation work going on. Um, I have a few mods that have actually made it so I can see what's going on in the battles a little bit better, so I can see some of the animations, and, and their team did a great job. And uh, Sound-wise, I think they did a great job, too. There's a lot more, like, yelling, and there's, as your men are marching, mm -hmm. they're, like, yelling, like, certain little remarks, and it, it, it really does kind of pull you into this sort of, uh, I don't want to say historic, but sort of this, like, Authentic version feeling. of this sort of version of antiquity that they've created. Yeah. They've created this very cool uh, ancient world, and it kind of has, it feels alive in some mm -hmm. ways. Uh, and I think that's great. And I think that's where they've accomplished. And they just need to make it so more people can experience that. <laughs> exactly. In like a nice, refreshing, you know, relaxed, without having to worry about like, how many frames am I dropping right now? This is stupid, you know? Yeah. Now there's another thing I forgot to mention, um, and I actually completely forgot about it until right now when we started talking about history. You're familiar with the Extra Credits team? The yes. podcast. Did you know that they're now doing a series called Extra Credits History about the Punic Wars? Because Creative <laughs> Assembly had some leftover money in their marketing budget, and they said, if we give you guys a bunch of money, can you do a history series about the Punic Wars? You don't even have to mention us, and you don't even have to mention the game. We just want to be able to point people to that and get them excited about the, the, the time period. And Extra Credits went and started the, the series, and the first one came out uh, like two days ago. It's really cool, uh, and I definitely recommend it. I put a link in the show notes for anybody that wants to check it out, or just search Extra Credits History on YouTube. Speaking on history, actually, this is probably the most historically accurate of the Total War games, you I want to say. I think so, because there's really subtle things that they've done. So, you know, there's no more made-up weird, like, there's not as many, like, fantasy units as mm. they quote, you know. Uh, the Roman the Roman faction feels very fleshed out from like what I know about Roman history. Like I think they have things correct there. Um, the objectives in game kind of gear you towards very historical sort of decision make. You know like how you spread out your empire was very sort of historically geared. Like you're, how you're going to interact with some of the AIs and stuff like that. And then also there's like really really subtle things. So like slingers have a longer range than bowmen mm -hmm. and archers. And that's actually historically accurate, that slingers would have longer ranges than bowmen in the ancient times. And I thought that's like really great, that like they are doing some really cool gameplay things with history. And I think that is sort of like where this game series, the Total War series, has kind of shined. Is like They've taken history and made it fun. And I, I think... What? Go on. Okay, the, the, the thing that I like, really liked about it is I tried starting a campaign as the... I mean, I played the Romans. I just love the freaking Romans. I played the Romans a couple of times, but yeah, I also everybody. started a campaign as uh, Athenians. And uh, what I did like is those chapter objectives that they give you. Like, you have the main objectives, how to win the game, like economic, uh, I think it's cultural or, or uh, warfare, right? And then they yeah. have, like, your missions. Like, every once in a while, the Senate will be like, hey... We got an invading army. Go take it out, and we'll give you a 500 wealth. Like, I'm making 8,000 a turn, dude. You really <laughs> think that 500's... An okay, I should probably do that anyway. <laughs> or they tell me to make a champion. Like, I ain't got time to make a champion. I'm making 200 wealth. I got uprisings in the north. You want me to make a fucking champion? <laughs> what? And, and then you're going to reward me by making his actions more effective for the next six turns? Get the fuck out of here. 
the, though those random missions are are always weird, but like the objectives, have you checked out the objectives? That's what I'm talking about. The chapter yeah. objectives. That's what I was trying to get to. Because those are really cool. Because yeah. they they give you a generic goal, like get two provinces under your control. But then they give you sort of a little uh, reward if you do it the historical way, but they don't force you to do it. There's nothing in the game forcing the game to go like history. The Romans don't have to go to war with the Carthaginians. They don't even have to take Sicily. They could ignore and make trade partners with the Carthaginians. You could get trade partners with Syracuse and add them as a client state and go north instead or go west to Spain. You could do whatever you want. You could invade Egypt and get your second province. But if you were to secure the uh, S uh, the Sicilian island, then you would get a little bit more. And if you were at war with Carthage when you uh, captured your second province, you'd get a little bit more. And so I, I really like that. And then you get to the next step, and it's like, okay, now you have to have 60 you know, uh, units, units yeah. at any point. And if you also were to control uh, some of this territory over here, then that would be good too. And if you had this over here, and then it was like, uh, I think, control 25 territories. Like, yeah, if you have something over here, that's that's good. And if you have this stuff over here, and it kind of pushes you in historical direction to where the Germans, exp the Germans, the Romans expanded at this time <laughs> period. I love that. And the, the Athenians had the same kind of pressures on their, you know, chapter objectives. It was great. I loved it. Who have you been playing as, by the way? I've played as Rome and actually Athens. I don't know why Athens just picked them. I like um, Athens too. I gave the uh, Inseni, Iceni. Iceni. I think it's yeah. Iceni. Yeah, I gave Iceni a whirl. They're they're wonky. Like any of the barbarians right now are considered really wonky just because of like the way they play. Oh, yeah, there's. Like, very... I feel like there's so much more of the game that I haven't really explored because I haven't tried the barbarian factions. I feel like they're playing. They they play very differently from the Hellenic. Uh, or the Latin factions. Yeah, and then there's also the Eastern factions too, mm. like the successor kingdoms and like, you know, the Pajama Party Pontus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Why are they Pajama Party Pontus? Because <laughs> in the original robe, there was like a unit that looked like they were just wearing pajamas <laughs> and they would go into battle. It's pretty great. And, okay. and they still kind of, they kind of look like they're wearing pajamas still. So it's pretty great. So the Pajama Party lives on. Fair enough. Um, yeah, and so like the Eastern things, and now uh, apparently modders, they just finished up. You can play everyone in the game, every 100 of the 17 factions, except for Rhodes. They still <laughs> haven't gotten Rhodes in Rhodos. there yet. Yeah. Rhodos. For some reason, Rhodes just, it's not playing games. With them. But yeah, it's, it's, it's great. They've constructed this, this world that I feel they haven't done since Empire. And I think that's great. And I think that's, that's what they needed to do. And I think that's what they wanted to do. And... Aside from all the issues, I, I, there's a lot of hope in this game, you know, down the line becoming, you know, the game that we all wanted right yeah. now. So the, the chapter, the chapter objectives, I think, work really well to giving the player both flexibility and historical guidance on what to do next. Very, very well done. Uh, so as a new player, it was very nice to to have it as Athens say, hey. You should probably take over, you know, Epirus, 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 whatever it is, Epirus? and then, yeah. uh, and then, and then fight Macedon to get your get your identity back, and you know, make yourself your own man and things like that. That was a really cool thing to have in there, because otherwise, I'd, you know, a new player, you might be overwhelmed, you might be a little lost. What do I do first? I could go any direction I really wanted to. Well, these are this is what you should maybe start with, and then you could make it up as you go along the next time, and maybe change your mind. The thing I didn't like though, I started as the Spartans once. They okay. cannot trade with anyone in the game unless they capture Athens. Well, they're landlocked. Yeah. And That's... you have to have a... Like, even if they capture ports outside of Athens, they can never trade with anyone because you have to have a trade route that can go all the way to your capital. Oh. So even if they conquered, like, all of Italy and all of everywhere else, no trade. Can't trade. Athens is the only port you can trade to. Once you open Athens, then you can trade with anybody. <laughs> oh, man. That I didn't me. realize that. That kind of bogs down Sparta into having to take over Athens. Yeah. Even though, even though they're programmed should... not to do that. They're programmed to like each other. So in most games, yeah. I haven't seen Athens and Sparta go to war. Ugh. Like, I, I, I don't know. I feel this is one of my kind of really nitpicky complaints. I think the Greek states are handled a little bit bad. Uh, they only have really three Greek states, or four. You know, you have Epirus, you have Athens, you have Sparta, and then you have also in considered in uh, 
Hellenes, Hellens, whatever they call it, the Hellenic. region of Greece. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gnosis, I think, is Crete, basically. Mm -hmm. So, like, you have kind of those regions, and they're just, there should be, like, really interesting sort of diplomatic stuff going on there, because traditionally Greeks are, you know, they're always independent, but yet, well, I don't know. They want to work together, yeah. It's post-Alexander, so I don't know how, like, things got really messed up after that. Yeah, but, much, but... I mean, the Carthaginians were a Greek colony as well. That's why they have the Hellenistic culture, uh, I thought if they you were look Punic. at them. Oh, you're right, they're Punic, but they were yeah. a Greek colony. But they sort of formed their own... Yeah. They, no, wait a minute. They were Phoenician. Sorry. I knew they were a colony of somebody. Uh -huh. They were Phoenician colonists that went and founded Carthage, and then it became its own culture. That's why it's called Punic. Sorry. Um, okay. So, uh, the... Syracuse is a Greek Greek colony. Okay, anyway, that's about history. So, uh, let's let's get down to the, the nitty-gritty. Let's talk about the big right. system in the game that's like a big change, and that's the whole economy and building mechanic in the game. We've got a bunch of regions and they're grouped into provinces. And as I started exploring the map and conquering things, I realized that provinces that contain four uh, regions were very rare. So getting those was good. Like Thrace was a province, I believe, that had four. Italia was one that had four. Africa was one that had four. Basically, the starting location of any major civilization that you can think of in the time uh, was a situation where it would, uh, it would have four. I think Egypt might have been one that also had four. But otherwise, you had like these two provinces and, and, and uh, three province, or three region provinces. Um, and because of the way that the economy and building systems work, having more regions in a single province was really powerful. Uh, so I was trying to beeline for anything that had three or four regions. Uh, that, was, that was a very interesting way of doing it. But what is, your, what is your main thoughts on the economy and building system? I like the sort of tiered structure of it. Um, I like that there's provinces that have a capital, and then the, there, is, um, there are all these like, different sort of settlements around. It also makes siege battles a little bit less annoying. Um, because you don't always have to fight a walled city and like wait for like 20 turns. You can just kind of directly assault the smaller scale cities, which is nice for like that conquest idea. But I really like the interplay of like buildings and how you're building up each part of the province. And like it, it really, there's like overlap between the different uh, mm -hmm. settlements in, within a province. And I really like the way that plays. I think that is really interesting and awesome. And I think that there's a lot of good thought behind that. And I think that's one of the best parts of the game. Mm hmm. Um, it's not perfect, but it, it's it's good. It's good, mm -hmm. and like like what we've been saying is, in a few months, you know, check back because it might be something really great they are on to. But the, I think there's a big downside is that um, if you're playing diplomatically and you want to kind of truly be friendly with people, um, it's always worse to not fully control a province than to have an ally in one of the one of your settlements in a province. Does that yeah. make any sense? No, yeah, so like, if, you, if you control two regions in a province, but the ally controls the capital, and they are a different <laughs> culture from you, that's a problem. <laughs> well, not even, like, cultural. Like, if you're both, like, a same culture, or, like, you're getting along fine, and there's no big issues, but, like, you own two out of the three, and they own, like, one of the minor settlements, you want to have, like, those synergies with your buildings going mm -hmm. on. So you want that you want that settlement really really bad. Yet they're your ally, and they, like let's say they've been fighting with you the whole game. You don't want to like go over there and stop them. Like they're your client state. They sh you know, and I think the client state thing needs to be fleshed out a little bit more. Like you should be able to tell them, no no no, you're building this because yeah. you're our or, client or, state. Or I would love to be able to give them things. Like there, in my first campaign, I decided to subjugate the Etruscans on Corsica. And then when I captured Sardinia from uh, from the Carthaginians, I, I really wanted to give it to the Etruscans so they could have that province as their own. They could just have that little square of the Mediterranean. That would be my own little Mediterranean Navy unit defending my sort of western flank as, as a mm -hmm. buffer, right? Yeah. And but I could not give it to them. Like, the only way I could figure out how to give it to them was to put my army and navy next to the city I wanted them to take and then, you know, put it as our military target and hope that they would send their armies down and attack it while I was nearby to help. That's about the only yeah. way it would work. I mean, I've been playing a lot of grand strategy games before Rome 2, so I was getting used to, like, having these really intricate diplomacy and, like, relationships with people, especially with, like, Europa 4 coming out mm -hmm. last month. 
I was like, I was vassalizing countries and, and then integrating them into my, you know, to my main state. And then I was forming these like complex alliances and like big wars would just un, like happen in like a second because we'd all these alliances would cascade out of control. Mm -hmm. And it, it was fun. Like I kind of got used to that and I kind of was expecting, I know Total War doesn't have the best diplomacy, but the, you know, this is a new iteration. They might actually like, I was reading about the client state thing. I'm like, oh, we can actually have like vassal states and these cool things that kind of pan out and it's kind of not panning out as, as well as it, you know, not well as it should, but like as well as I thought it was going to be. And, you know, I noticed uh, uh, when I did make them my client state, I think they actually offered to be my client state or maybe I conquered one or the other. I had a client state and I wound up actually having a good relationship with them. After a while, they forgot about the whole war thing and we managed to get a trade <laughs> route going and we had a defensive alliance and, and whatever. But uh, – or no, they were my client state so we didn't have a defense. Anyway, um, the – the thing when you hover over the agreement for the client state, it says tribute that they're giving you. It was always zero. I don't know if it's only because they only had one city. Maybe they weren't making enough profit to send me tribute. But no, that because doesn't I know, seem right. I know when you're Athens, you start as a client state to uh, Macedon, Macedon. Yeah. And you send them 100 gold a turn, I think. Huh. So I don't know how I that think pans it, out. I think it was either not showing it correctly or it was broken. That That's very annoying. But yeah. the other thing that happened is when I had a, a, a little tiny one-city empire on my uh, sort of um, western flank above the Danube or something like that when I was playing the Romans, and they, I guess, were in trouble. They, they had lost a bunch of their territory, and they wanted to be my client state. So I said, I'm actually thinking about expanding in that. <laughs> I'm actually thinking about setting up some real estate in that area as it happens, so why don't we do that? And I'll go to war with whoever you're at war with, and then, you know, we can, we can carve out a little piece for ourselves there. But when I made them my client state, we didn't like go to war with the same people automatically like that didn't happen or we did like i expected like peace suddenly to happen because all of a sudden these guys are the client state of rome now you have to decide do you still want to be at war with rome right and i expected a new diplomatic screen to pop up and saying we're declaring war on you rome because you're you're protecting these guys or like giving me the option like do you sure you want to go to war with these guys nothing like that happened instead they stayed at war with somebody and i didn't even get a chance to go to war until somebody else declared war on my little client state and then i got asked hey do you want to join this war and i said sure and then i started going to war but I expected it to be more like Civ V, where if you declare war on a, a vassal or you know, uh, uh, or Civ Four, similar like those kinds of games, that that automatically declares war on the 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 bigger protector as well. You're not just declaring war. That's what client state means. You're yeah, supposed to be protecting like, them. Ugh. Not only just protecting them, like it's it's like sort of forced vassalage, but like there's some benefits for the people who are in vassalage. Like right. they have kind of a an overlord that's gonna take care of them and you know do trade with them i think that's the biggest thing is that as a, as a client state with macedon you can't actually trade with them as athens for some reason macedon's like no yeah what is that Don't about you should it. have an I'm automatic like... trade route and you should have an automatic military alliance with them but it's like for some reason you don't have a military alliance with your client states by default I feel yeah. like client state is a step above military alliance and if you go like okay non-aggression pact defensive alliance military alliance client state like, that's how it should be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, the other thing that I noticed is the AI is not very good. If they get – I mean, cities can't produce, at least with the civilized cultures, the Roman and the Greeks, cities can't produce agricultural – like, the walled cities can't produce agricultural districts because they're cities. They're not, you know, yeah, it makes sense. rural areas. Sure, it makes sense. But if you – are a tiny little empire uh, and you get trapped in one walled city. I just seen a walled city that's just constantly starving for like 30 turns because it, they got boxed into just a city and they can't figure out how to make any food. I know with the Romans, if you make a delicatessen, then you can at least make some food. But I don't think that would be enough to... Eh, maybe you could pay for, for the, the stuff that's in one city. But they just... Just there would be cities that were just starving to death because they didn't have the ability to make food. I don't know if maybe those barbarians didn't have the tree that would let them make food, or if it was just the AI was stupid and not making food for twenty turns. It's probably the AI just being stupid. It's possible. Like there's a lot of complaints about the <laughs> campaign AI. 
So let's talk uh, more about how the how the buildings work. Because I I love how yeah. it's it's province specialization now instead of city specialization. It took me a while to figure out that everything is province wide. But when I yeah. did, it's like a light bulb went off and suddenly everything made sense. Yep. It works really it's, well. It's fantastic. I think it's like one of the best things they've kind of like brought to the Total War series in a lot of ways. Um, like I'm playing on my Rome game. Uh, my province of Rome is training my heavy infantry. So like it's going to have my, uh, has my cohort barracks in it. So it's training like my more frontline infantry. And then I have my auxilla barracks and Magna Gracia. Mm -hmm. And I have like a workshop in each one of those. So like those units are getting benefits yep. from the upgrades. And like the way I'm like planning out, I'm like, all right, this, this, you know, this settlement has more ports than anything. So maybe I need to look at like maritime commerce as a, as a viable sort of like way to specialize this port. And, but then I have to worry about like, you know, my happiness. And of course this brings up the whole happiness, food, squalor. What is it? Yeah. I think those are like yeah. the three things they have to manage in a province outside yeah. of like wealth. It, it basically, I was very annoyed when I first ran into that problem. It's like tier three buildings. If they produce food, then they cost you public order. If they produce public order, then they cost you food. And sometimes they cost both. Like the main city, I don't want to call it city center because city center are the yellow buildings. I'm talking about the orange buildings, the main city that the you culture? upgrade. The, I guess the culture building, yeah, like the governmental district. I would, that's what I would call it, but I don't think it's, is it called culture? Oh, the actual, it's like the actual city upgrade or something. Yeah, but I don't, it's yeah. not, they're all called different things. They're like market cities and wine oh, yeah, cities yeah. and different kinds of cities. So I, I think I'm just going to call it the, the, the governmental district. I like to call them okay. districts because calling them buildings is stupid. It seems like you get this giant thing that appears off the side of the map and it produces a ton of stuff for you, but it's just one building. <laughs> So I'm calling yeah, that, them districts, that, damn it. That first slot is sort of like the government slot. Like, what right. is this sort of, like, basis of, like, what are they producing here? You know, what is it doing for your overall thing? What's your sort of structure of, like, your garrison? Mm -hmm. and, well, you know, when it's attacked. So, yeah, it's, I guess, like, province, district. And, the, and that, that capital, the walled cities, all produce some culture for the whole province. Not a whole lot. Not nearly as much as you can with, like, the religious buildings. Uh it's not. The primary slot is not the city center because the yellow Roman buildings are called city center buildings. Like, they all have types, like religious building type, and you have military building type. And then the yellow ones are called city center, which is just wrong. <laughs> like, those should be called something else. I don't know what you could call those, but... Well, I, no, no, no. If you think about it like this, like, that first slot is, like, what is the city? Yeah, what point. the city is, is. Is it, like, a small little hamlet? Is it an actual, right. like, full... Well, city, like city size almost or and then city center is like what's in the middle of that city so right. it's like a building that you build so i know like the barbarians they can get like a meat hall or something and then uh the romans get like you know the Colosseum, yeah or something like sort of like a big thing in that city resistance fox commented on youtube he said why are you guys talking about this game already it's still an alpha <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right so but so we get to the point where your, your city's getting to level three and four buildings, and all of a sudden, the food and or public order or disorder, unhappiness, whatever you want to call it, is going out of control. Because you just, every time you upgrade things, you're looking at stuff like, oh, I got like 20 food. And then you're just upgrading things, but each of those things takes like five turns. So you don't realize that you've already gotten under negative food. Like you're upgrading <laughs> these three things, and you're just upgrading the next things, and they start to kick in turn after turn. And you're like, oh shit, what did I just do? And then you have to re hum everything up. Uh, the game does at least let you change things around. Like if you have a religious building and you went like a shrine of Mercury, you can like click it and like convert it to a shrine of Jupiter or something if you need, you know, something else really quickly and fairly cheaply. Which I kind of liked. I didn't have to destroy the whole thing and start from scratch at level one. That was really good. I was happy about that. Yeah, that mechanic works really well, especially when you're capturing non sort of your primary culture. Mm -hmm. So like you have the buildings don't work for you at all when they're you're not your your culture. I think they so do. Kind of like they still work. Like the military recruitment buildings won't work, but the food buildings still produce food. I believe it just says it won't upgrade until you convert it. Oh, I'm. I'm Roman, so like Romanize everything. There you go. You know, get, change it all. <laughs> but I everything. did notice the the main government city size orange building um, will produce a much weaker garrison until you convert it to your side. Like it won't give you legionaries uh, as as the main general of your defending force 
of a level three captured building, only if you convert it to a Roman town or whatever that level three building is, will you then get legionaries involved. So you do want to, after you capture a building, you know, switch it over to your, switch the main building over to your faction as quick as possible so you can get a much better and stronger garrison. It does seem to make a pretty significant difference. So we were talking about uh, more about these buildings here. What did you do is to, in terms of trying to lock down an economic strategy? Like, this is going to be a province that makes me money. How does it make you money? Oh, man, I don't think I've actually specialized provinces in money-making. Contrary to, like, all my other Total War experiences where I've said, this is going to be my money-making city or whatever. Ah. I've, I actually haven't done that. I've said, like, each province has is big enough to hold enough commerce in it to make money. But then also you have to have unit recruitment because the way the Romans work is they work with auxiliary troops. So sort of local troops from the area coming into their army. And actually Rome gets a lot of cool units uh, depending on where you have auxiliary camps built. So like, you know, auxiliary camps in Egypt will give you certain special units that you can't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sort of like looking at, all right, what's my military capacity going to be in this? All right, for the military capacity... Um, where am I going to, you know, I need to have a workshop because you're not going to build units and just, like, upgrade them to nothing. Um, and then also you have to keep in mind, like, you know, food production. You have to constantly be making farms. And then your your what kind of farms and, like, what kind of ports you're making all have to tie into cities or into what you're doing in your main province capital. So, like, what kind of, you know, city center am I going to have? Am I going to have a, you know, a, 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 you know, like a market there, like a wine market to increase commerce? And I'm finding that sort of gearing towards um, unit production generally is, is a better thing to do just because money kind of comes in really easier as you get more and more provinces and as you build them up. As long as you're just kind of doing upgrades. I find that I'm not a fan of fishing ports, even though they're great. <laughs> I, I kind of like having like one fishing port province maybe and then, you know, sort of uh, more wharfs and stuff like that to build boats because I'm finding my navy severely lacking in so many cases. Yep. So... Here's what I did. I did, okay. did you figure out how piracy works? Okay, so what I understand thus far, it's like it's just a, a flat modifier on your your shared region or like whatever your sea region is that the port is next to. So if you have navies patrolling there, it helps reduce it, and it reduces the maritime commerce that a uh, settlement produces. So it's that's as far as I got. Yes, and it's different. If you control every port on a sea region, it's considered okay. a controlled region and piracy is at 9%. If you are sharing it with other nations or factions that you're not at war with, it's called a shared region and piracy is at 28%. If you're actively at war with another faction that has a port on that sea, piracy is at 57%. Okay. So... And then, of course, if they have navies that are, you know, raiding stance in that sea, then it goes up even more. And if you have people on patrolling, you can cut it down uh, in, in, in any of those cases. So what I decided, like, okay, so the thing about, if you look at any of the buildings in the game, it looks like the harbors, the trading ports, bring in the most bang for your buck. But then it's reduced by that maritime piracy issue right because it'll say it's like the level two port brings in something like or maybe it's level three it's like 240 maritime and then another 120 local commerce that's a ton of income from a single building so it's like i'm gonna make sure this happens so i decided i'm going to control every port on the terranean sea and every port on the other one i can't remember i think the terranean sea is the one to the east of the Roman uh, Peninsula and then the other one to the west, right? So the one to the west has Neapolis, Corsica, and Sardinia. And so I took care, took care of those early on. So then I controlled that province and I made three harbors on that thing and I started rolling in cash because there was no real reduction from piracy. It was 9%. It was not much at all. And then I did the same thing, but I had to go all the way down the uh, the, the sort of Yugoslavian area there, um, all the way down towards uh, near where um, the Epirus uh, guys were, which was Spartan by the time I got there. So I went and took <laughs> over all that, and that has three more ports on it, and I made that all into trade hubs. And by the way, in each of these uh, provinces, uh, I, in, in the Italia province, in the Corsica and Sardinia provinces, and in the provinces on the coast there, uh, I tried to put temples to Neptune, which increases maritime commerce by like 40%. So 
So I was rolling in cash. But I was like, every time I converted over another fishing thing, I'm like scrambling to find more food. Like, where can I put more food <laughs> production? So the, the Sicily in the bottom of the boot, what is that? Magna Cardia something? Magna Gracia? Gracia. Uh, I yeah. turned that into my um, naval production and bread basket. I just made as much agriculture buildings as I could possibly make in there. And then for the for Syracuse and Brunundrumium. I can never remember the name of that walled city down there. Um, I made that one my military wharf, and then I made Syracuse the dry dock one, so that I would be able to build all my navy in that, because that would also be controlled. And when it's uh, recruitment costs and replenishment of your navy is also dependent on shared versus uh, controlled versus conf- uh, contested. So if you're if you control it you actually get a minus 5% to your recruitment cost for naval. Oh. If it's shared at zero, if it's contested, the recruitment cost is increased by 10% because they're harassing you while you're trying to train your troops. That's kind of a really nice little, really cool detail that I really like about it. Like, that didn't have to be there. But the, And then the replenishment of your naval forces is also changed depending. It, they replenish a lot faster in a sea zone that you fully control. I just thought... Oh, that's so cool. See, it, it's like there's some really cool mechanics at work here. And it, it, like this is going to be probably, I know you're going to agree with me, it's like this game does not have really great ways to show you that information. No, it doesn't. It took me so yeah. long to figure all that shit out. I had to do like trial and error. Like I went to war with a province ju- or with, a, with a faction just so I could take over their port to find out what would happen if I controlled all three ports in the zone. <laughs> 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 the other thing that was fucking killing me. I could not figure out for the life of me why I had vision of the Carthaginian city in Sardinia all the time. A hundred percent of the time I could see everything oh, happening right? there. Uh, the walled one in the, the south of uh, Sardinia. What's it called? Uh, Damn it, now Corsica? I wish I... No, the Corsica is the north one. Oh, Sardinia. Yeah, it's called Sardinia is the name of the thing. I just don't remember what the, what the game oh, calls Oh, the city? It. The city name. Oh. But anyway... I couldn't, it's like Crelius or something. I couldn't figure out why I had vision of that. Since the beginning of the game, I had, yeah, Corellus. Corre, 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 yeah, Corellus. Uh, I couldn't figure it out. And then finally dawned on me that I had vision to every port city on a sea in which I had a port, which was sort of representing local trade that. You would hear rumors about, oh, well, in Corellus, they're raising an army. So you would know when an army was being raised there. But you don't get automatic vision on cities where, you know, in a different sea, like Genoa. You don't get an automatic vision on Genoa because Neapolis is in a different sea zone from Genoa. So you have to bring a spy up there if you want to see what's going on. Details like that, it just, that enhances the game so much. But they don't tell you anything. Like, you can hover over the eye that tells you, hey, you have information about this city, but it doesn't tell you why. No, they leave that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that. I think trade also gives you vision. A trade too. route does appear to give you vision, yes. And that was much more yeah. obvious, because you'd see this giant line that you suddenly have vision of across the entire Mediterranean Sea over to Spain. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you went, like, around Spain or something, it was just some silly, like, you could see everything, know what's going on. But that, that's kind of, like, how it would work. Like, rumors would whistle down from, like, trade routes and stuff. Like, yeah. hey, like, there's an army over there. I was like, oh, crazy. Uh, it's just, like, the, and I think this is one of my personal biggest gripes with the game. I do have a lot of gripes. But uh, it just doesn't display information. Like, a UI should be clean, and it does look clean, the UI, but it's, like, it's not really... Um, totally fleshed out and it, Honestly, just, it I think, hides things I think it gives you tons of really useful information but it doesn't explain it to you and that's the problem I had to oh sorry about that how did that happen ah because there sorry your head oh. disappeared <laughs> Back. Here so um, how they display in the game is great. I can usually mouse over something to learn more details about how it's being computed. But why it's being computed, where did that first value come from, 
is baffling and you have to do a lot of trial and error and figuring things out because God forbid you look up any of the game mechanics in the Civilopedia. It gives you a single <laughs> paragraph of basically flavor text that doesn't explain anything mechanically about how the game works. The only really useful things that it has is unit statistics and uh, statistics on the agents and the generals and the things like that. But even those aren't nearly as useful as they could be. Um, speaking of them, what do you think about the agents and the upgrade paths and stuff of the agents and the generals and like those little cards to upgrade with and stuff? I think that the system, I'm not going to talk about like tree yet i'm gonna hold off on the tree but i think like this is something they've been using since oh man i want to say empire but i don't think it was an empire but something at least in shogun 2 was there and it worked out really well you kind of you kind of became attached to like your agents and your generals because they all kind of got these like cool traits to them and things like that and they and and you kind of like learn because like some generals had certain passives that others didn't and you kind of use them in different agents in different places the the problem with this is that it doesn't lay that information out well enough for you. So I like the RPG mechanics and stuff like that, but I don't like one. The game does not introduce you to these like how these different agents work at all. It says, "Oh, you should recruit a spy," and then it never tells you anything else on how to use a spy. <laughs> like yeah. it doesn't like Solan Solarnus or whatever his name is doesn't come out and say like, "Hey, you know, hey, this is how we use the spies to do this." No, he doesn't do that. And then the second part is um, due to one turn being a year, your agents are people, and they die at a certain point. So when you start getting a really good agent or someone that comes very specialized in something, and they're you know, you starting like, all right, now I can use this person, they're like 72, and then they just die. <laughs> so it sucks. Like Due to other thing, decisions they made in the game, like the agents and generals even, don't get used as as often as I or like you don't get to use them build them up and then use them as you would want the game kind of moves too fast through history basically yeah and then there's turn the world's like I just need to do this quick turn and and like get through this turn so I can get this thing over here but then like you don't realize that you're wasting a lot of time for like generals and stuff and then there's like that really flimsy political system that's in the game oh it looks Have like that when i first saw that i'm like wow this looks really interesting i can't wait to dive into this and then i tried to learn it and i'm like what does it fucking do yeah what does it do i saw no effects of everything apparently the only thing that entire political system is there to do is to eventually spark a civil war that yeah apparently has no real nobody can really tell you how it sparks like some people are saying okay when you get over 70 percent with one faction or under other people are like well i was at 49 percent. it came anyway and the the civil war that sparks is has is not affected at all by anything you've done like you would hope like okay maybe generals from my family would be the loyal ones or maybe i could yeah. ones i could bribe or like there, there's nothing you can do to even affect how the civil war starts it's a random city it takes and then they get a random number of units based on difficulty no, all the generals that were yours stay with you. There's no, like, oh, there could have been so much more cool things going on there. Maybe there still I will be. I think that this comes back to the game was put out a little bit earlier than it should have been. And I, from what they talked about in interviews was they gave the impression that you would have to kind of manage your generals because, like, in his history, certain generals would kind of go rogue and just go crazy. Yeah. And I feel like this political system was going to be something along the lines of you have to make alliances you have to sort of marry other people into your faction to keep a sort of balance of power and that was like kind of what rome ancient rome was all about it was like sort of this balance of power that's why you have like the triumvirate of like uh caesar uh pompey and then the other guy that i always forget about because he dies so like no i don't think it was augustus it was some other guy who just died in a battle and like that messed everything up oh okay but like so you have this sort of like weird balance of power and uh, in all these different areas at, at different times and i thought the, the way they said it, like, you have to watch out because, like, one of your good generals could all of a sudden, you know, if you're not treating him well or, like, or you don't give him enough if prestige. if he has too much ambition and yeah. he gets too popular, he might think that he could be dictator for life. And then he'll turn on you and you have to be ready for it. And then you're acting as senate. Like, there's so many cool things that could be there. And I really yeah. hope they flush it out. Yeah, it's not a fully fleshed out system. And then um, there's there's, like weird events that happen sort of like a crusader king status of like oh this guy popped up and he's like you know someone died all right what are we gonna do and then like you get these like really 
kind of uninteresting choices to just give you a small buff or something. Yeah. It's like you lose 25 senators. Okay. And I think this comes back to, I think this system would be interesting because it, I know as Rome, you get certain buffs. So like if you can increase promotion on one of your generals, so someone within your family, obviously you're not going to give someone else a promotion. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a certain buff. So it like reduces military unit costs by like yeah. 5% across the bar. I'm like, that's that. a really good, yeah. Military Tribune, like that's. But a you have to give to up some senators. I think that's like you're calling it, in some some debts or something, or your or your, favors, your yeah. some favors that they owe you, and you no longer they no longer owe you those favors anymore. So they're no longer you know quite as tight to your family. Like if there was more to it than just the one thing, like secure promotion. Like that's the only button in there that does anything mechanically important with the whole thing. Oh, I wish there was more to it. Yeah, and it's like there's a, there's something there's like outlines of a really cool idea that they had. And it would be cool because I, from what I've been reading and what I've been seeing, is like there's basically a realm of, a realm divide in this game. Mm -hmm. So you didn't play Shogun two, you don't know what the realm divide is. The realm divide is a piece of shit. I hate it. <laughs> it's literally like in, in in Shogun two at a certain point, the Shogun sort of declares civil war in Japan, like full on civil war, mm -hmm. and you will start slowly get a decreasing or slowly get an increasing relations penalty with everyone in Japan. Everyone. <laughs> so people who are your vassals, who have been vassals or like friends with you since the start of the game, will go away and automatically hate you within a certain number of turns. That's so and, gamey. Ah. Yeah, and, and they kind of fixed it with like, uh, with uh, Fall of the Samurai. It became more of like, okay, now everyone's choosing a side. Everyone's splitting. So like, you and a bunch of people are going to be on one side. You and a bunch of other people are going to be on another side. And it kind of ended up being a little bit more fun in Fall of the Samurai. But in this game, from what I'm reading, is it's just like, boom, civil war. You don't have a choice in anything. Nothing you've done up until this point can really change anything. They're taking a city. Here's like 20 stacks of armies to deal with. Good luck. And I feel like this political system was going to be some way for you to sort of manage the civil war before it happened. And it was going to determine how the civil war started. Yeah. Like, does this house, you know, be the one that, that declares independence or or calls for the senators to to you know kill you off because you're getting too powerful like there's so much that could have been done but it looks to me like they said well we have like two weeks to put this system in, in into place how about we just you know make it so that it spawns a bunch of units when these numbers pass those numbers <laughs> that's about yeah. all it did and and it, right now the system I mean, it'd be cool to see what some of the higher end traits are because I think they probably are pretty strong. But or because of like the year per turn thing and the cost, you have to put like 4,000 denarii or income or whatever they're calling it in this game into just securing a promotion for a guy. It, the cost benefit is so low and, mm -hmm. and the guy's going to die in like 10 turns anyway <laughs> from just being old. So, like, why even waste the time? The we don't, you don't need a promotion. You're old. <laughs> yeah, it's like, who cares? Even though, like, a lot of these guys were in their 50s and stuff when they became consoles, so, I mean. Yeah. Now, talking more about the agents, like, you got the spies, the, the champions, and the dignitaries. And I really like the, the interactions that they can have on the field. Like, you can put a ch you can only put one of them with your army, and each of them does really cool stuff. A spy will protect your general from assassinations and manipulations and prevent people from poisoning the food. Like, he's like, I know all the tricks. I'm gonna protect you. And then the, the, the champion will, like, uh, you know, I think it makes your guys march a little further, it but trains mostly them. it trains them over time. They get better, and it doesn't do it too fast either. It seems like I got like early on, you get like a bar of veterancy real quick, but later, it, you know, when you're already at level five, it's gonna take a really long time for a trainer for for a veteran, uh, you know, trainer guy to get you to level six. But anyway, um, and then the dignitary, he will go and in, in like basically like this is. This is all very inefficient. I could organize this baggage train <laughs> way better and ca save us tons of gold. And so you, he lowers your upkeep. I love that that's an option. That's a great set of choices to make. You've only got this many kinds of, you've only got this many agents. Some of them need to be used for this purpose. Which one of them is going with this army? That's a great design setup to create some opportunity costs there. And I think that they're really well balanced. But the... <laughs> the other things you could do with them, you could deploy them in a friendly zone and they do some other cool things like they increase tax rate for the dignitary, the champion sort of 
brings up public fervor and improves public order and the spy uh, makes it easier to detect enemy spies. That's all good too. But then you can also use them to attack enemy armies or cities and disrupt them or sabotage them in many different ways. Nine different ways if on a settlement or city. Yeah. Another nine different ways on an enemy army. And then another... Actually, they all really just have the same set for interacting with other agents. Like, do you want to assassinate them or do you want to convert them? And which attribute do you want to use? So those ones are kind of boring. My problem yeah, but with... Each- Sorry, Each attribute gives like a different effect, and and like what I'm finding is like certain effects are just blatantly better. Like poisoning a city is always the best thing to do because it reduces siege holdout time and it damages the garrison. Yeah, like that is the best thing to do if you're sieging. But then there's also like uh, I think you wanted you should explain your uh, scenario you were telling me earlier. Well, no, my about problem Sparta. with all of this is that it it's all super unintuitive. Like, you've got the three, you've got zeal and authority and cunning, right? And each one is better for a different thing for a different agent. Like, there's no unifying, like, understanding. Okay, authority is good at, uh, you know, anything to do with morale or public order. And cunning is good for anything where you're doing something sneaky like poisoning. And the other one is only good for these things. Like, it's all just this big, giant mix of a giant matrix of, like, 27 things that you have to memorize. And yeah. that drives me insane. Uh, <laughs> but, anyway, there are some really cool things you can do with it. I wanted to take a single region away from Sparta without declaring war on them, because I was already in, like, a six wars. Because I'm Rome, and that's how we roll. But... <laughs> but war with everyone. Yeah. Fight them all. But I needed to take this one because it was the capital. It was the the main uh, walled city of the province, and I had the other two regions. Um, and it was the the province right alongside uh, the 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 Tyrrhenian Sea um, to the east of of Rome. Um, and so I thought, okay, maybe I can get the peasants to rise up and throw Sparta out, and then I'll go in to put down the uprising, and Sparta can't really blame me. I mean, they won't. Ha- they, they'll probably hate me, and in fact, they did hate me. I'm glad that there are diplomatic penalties, and you can't just do that for free. But they didn't have causes belli, right? Only if you get caught. Yeah, uh, but you like how I threw the, ro- the, the Latin in there? Eh? Yeah, I saw that. That's good. That's, like that's about the only like two it. words I know. <laughs> that and triarii. <laughs> triarii. They actually say it right now. Is that right? I got the impression that they were using like an Italian uh, uh, dialect. With... No, the correct pronunciation in Latin of triari is triari. Okay, I always thought so... it was triarii because they would yell it at you in Rome 1. In Rome like, 1, that's what they'd always say, triarii, guy... principe. Like, okay. This guy actually knows what he's talking about, obviously, because he's yelling it. Yeah, I was so wrong. it must have been backwards. Maybe Rome 1 Italianized them, and Rome 2 is using the Latin, the Latinization. Anyway, that's out of the... The point is, I wanted to try to take this over through dastardly secret means, mwahahahaha. So uh, it was actually the uh, da- da- where the Darose are in the video you're looking at right now, along the Illyria province. So I go in there with like two spies, a dignitary, and a champion, and I'm just gonna use like the authority option every time: foment unrest, foment unrest, foment unrest, and all of them. And it was nice that at least all of them unrest was at the top. The champion tries to get the slaves to rise up. The dignitary makes it so that the uh, any any differences in culture become much much more uh, exaggerated. So if you have negative penalties from culture difference, which they did because I had the other two cities pumping out culture, um, then the, the dignitary makes those penalties worse. And the spy just dumps unhappiness in there. <laughs> He's just like, hey, here, have 20 unhappiness. <laughs> so I did this, but I had to keep doing this every turn. And they were at like 70 happiness or something, positive 70. So I had to pay like 400 for each of these actions. So I had to, and then not everyone would succeed. So I on average estimated that I probably spent about 1,200 a turn uh, in order to get a negative effect of sufficient quality for about five turns. And it got them down to negative 100. And at that point, and this happened to me as well, this is how I know what exactly was going on. When it gets down to negative 100, a rebellion starts. And it doesn't make a big deal out of it. 
doesn't doesn't like not a thing that says the populace is rebelling you should take a look at no it just completely just maybe throws a little like silent event up there on the event board uh saying they're really unhappy but it doesn't tell you that they're rebelling (laughs) you'll just suddenly find a rebel army in your territory um and it and it increases every turn by four units and when it gets big enough it'll go and attack the city and try to take it so i've seen this happen and what happens is when you hit that 100, no matter what your negative modifiers are, the game adds a positive modifier to take you up to plus 20 per turn. So if your negative modifier is like negative 50, it'll add plus 70 in order to make sure that you get to exactly plus 20 a turn. So it goes from 100 to 80 to 60 to 40. And when it does that, each step of the way, you're getting rebels going and joining that rebel army. And the modifier is called malcontents leaving to join the rebellion. And I think that is a beautiful way to handle this system because otherwise you could have a just constant, constant rebellion forever and you would never be able to deal with it because there would always be a rebellion penalty and all these other things. So I think that works great. So then a big rebel army comes and attacks you. And if your problems are still there, it's going to go back to 100 again and the rebels are going to come at you again. Problem is, I was spending 1,200 a turn for about five or six turns before this finally started happening. Um, and then when it did happen, Sparta crushed the rebels in one turn and they stopped coming. And then I made it happen again. And Sparta didn't see them this time. Or was, actually, Sparta was like low on food. They were like attritioning everywhere at this point because the AI was bad. So they couldn't instantly crush it. So I got up to eight people and it took the city and I finally took it. But I probably spent like 30K on this endeavor wow. over the course of several do- you know dozen turns hoping and trying to get this to work. I could have just raised like three armies <laughs> and gone after the one city. I could have taken over all of Sparta for that fucking cost. <laughs> so it has some bugs to be worked out. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely some balancing that needs to be worked out. And I mean, there's some, like, I like that idea of like the rebels kind of leaving the town. So the town overall feels a little bit happier but they're kind of like not going away they're kind of going out into like the wilderness and kind of organizing i just wish it was a little bit more hidden like they should be an ambush stance when they appear by default so that Mm because i what i it seems like when you attack the rebels it immediately ends the rebellion now it won't give you that positive modifier anymore so if you attack the rebels at minus 80 you're going to stay at minus 80 and if you're your public order is still a problem, it's going to go keep going down. So you might have to deal with it again. It means you have to keep an army there, which is a penalty. But it would be nice if it wasn't so damn easy. You know, I would kind of like the, the rebels to be hiding somewhere and you have to go find them and maybe walk into an ambush. Like That'd be pretty cool. Or use a spy, because if you have a spy in the territory, it makes it easier to find them. But again, that's another penalty. You have to make sure you bring a spy back to the territory. You're, it's an opportunity cost. Do you want to like have your army walk into an ambush, or do you want to wait until you get a spy back there or recruit a spy? Those are all great decisions that are sort of very difficult, and they make you want to go both directions. I like that. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, it, there's there's some good stuff going on. Like there are some really interesting systems and like really cool ways. I just don't think they're 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 thought out well enough. I don't think that like why do you have to pay 30k gold to get a simple rebellion? I mean, in in, in Shogun Two. Uh, you literally walked up to it, paid like a K, and then there was an instant stack army appearing. Now that's not as fun <laughs> as like no. as as like what this is like kind of doing, and the way the systems work now, like the way happiness works in that game, and the way it works in this one are totally different. But it, it was kind of fun because I was able to like kind of take cities from my allies that way yeah. without actually having to declare war and I think that's really sneaky if you have a really good agent who can do that that's awesome and I think that should be the benefit of agents on the map it's like they're, they're able to do these things that you just can't do otherwise yep T-Man was confused he thought that we were streaming the, the game live and my voice was desynced again this is a stream that I was uh-huh. doing before we're just using his background footage so you can kind of look at what we're talking about uh, in general uh, I had my face in there at the time I thought it was really cool now I see it's blocking all the faces of the generals <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's confusing people now, so maybe next time I won't do that. Uh, and maybe it was taking up extra CPU cycles that could have been used to cycle through the turn time. Hey. Uh, man, that turn time. I think if I was to actually follow people's advice and, like, get up and do sit-ups and stuff while I'm waiting for the turn to process, I would be, like, a Spartan <laughs> <laughs> in, in, like, 50 hours of playing this game. <laughs> I mean, that brings up a good point. 
like this game right now does not really respect our time as players no in a lot of ways and that's something that really pisses me off in video games is like when they don't respect your time and it, it's sort of like it, just the turn times and if you haven't i don't know have you co-opt yet at all i tried oh my god i tried it's like the turn yeah. times times four it's way worse yeah it's it's literally like five minutes a turn because it cycles through 117 factions, which is great that there's that many factions in the game, and now they're all unlocked, except for roads. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but, but, yeah, it's great that there's, like, you don't have to worry about, like, the super rebel province or whatever, like, the rebel faction. Who cares? But it, it, it just, oh, it's terrible. Like, you gotta wait. And it gets longer as the game goes on, because now there's, like, you have more vision of what's going on in the world, so, like, more processing power is being used, and... Man, it, it, this game is not like you. The load times are obviously better than what Shogun 2 was, but... Yeah, I heard Shogun is 2 bad. was really bad. They found out they were loading the entire battle uh, system oh, yeah. and campaign system simultaneously. Every yeah, time they loaded one engines. of them, they loaded both. <laughs> there were two different engines. So, like, when the game booted up originally, it was, like, a three-minute launch yeah. with an SSD. So, like, it would have to just unload everything. And then... The way it worked between battle and campaign was it opened up different engines. So the campaign engine changed and like unloaded and opened the battle. And then when the battle ends, it has to close the battle engine and open up the campaign engine. Yeah. Like this is what someone explained it to me as. And then apparently the bottleneck wasn't actually hard drive. It was it was um, GPU. Really? So like how much your GPU can process is how fast those engines opened up. And because no GPU was like a thousand billion you know, like years or whatever, it couldn't process all that information, open up the engines in like 20 seconds, which so, is just very silly. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a trade-off, right? In Rome, they had like a dozen factions and then a ton of area that was just like, it was just called rebel territory. Like each individual city was on its own. They wouldn't count as their own main. This one, they're like, we're going to make that shit authentic. We're going to make every single thing have a faction, even if it's a tiny one city faction, like Rhodes, or a tiny one city faction, like this little barbarian camp in the middle of Gaul. Uh, you know, you could totally just crush them and they usually do get crushed like these single one city factions these little city states they oftentimes will just get crushed right away sometimes they'll expand a little bit sometimes they turn into a juggernaut which is really cool when that happens <laughs> um so i love the amount of variability that adds to the game uh yep. i guess i just keep seeing all these different factions that i have no idea like who the hell are you <laughs> why are you on my doorstep how what happened to the guys that were here before <laughs> 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 so that that's really great it can add a lot more narrative to it but again you're right you'd have to if i think in order to speed it up uh, maybe it can be optimized if it can be optimized and they can speed it up 10 20 30 50 percent that would be fantastic but the question is if it can't really be optimized if this is as good as it gets without dumbing making the ai even stupider are you willing to throw away you know 50 factions and just give a bunch of rebel territories in the middle that are going to get gobbled up anyway. But then again, once they get gobbled up, the AI is just going to be that slow again. Damn it. Can't why wait. do I have to choose? Like, seriously, it's 2013. Uh, why do I have to choose between, like, good AI and fast turns? You have games like Grand Strategy Games, like, oh, they're, now they're not as intense as this game. But they're making extremely interesting diplomatic decisions in real time. And not just one country or five countries or 12 countries or 100 countries. Like, these huge... Like, You're talking about you, paradox you, games. <laughs> yeah, paradox <laughs> games. And they're maneuvering troops and they're calculating, like, days, like, when things are going to arrive. And they're making decisions on diplomacy, like, who to ally. They're all in real time without actually lagging your game up. If you have a good CPU that can handle that information, it is processing it really fast. Why do we have to choose between sh shorter load times and a better AI? That's stupid. It's 2013. Like, let's. I feel let's like step there's, up games a there's bit. got to be a way to calculate. Well, part of the advantage there is that it's in real time, right? You can have stuff running sort of parallelly, parallelly, parallel yeah. to each other. Um, the problem with a turn based system is you can't run the next guy until the first guy's done. Because the actions of the first guy will affect the second guy. I was thinking, about, maybe we can just like have him start on either end of the world. Like stuff in Persia is never going to affect what's going on in Britain 
Except it could, because if stuff in Britain causes the Roman Empire to send troops up that way, yep. and that means that the Roman Empire doesn't have troops, and then Greece declares war on Rome, now the faction that controls the Persian area might declare war on Greece, because now they're in an alliance. I don't know. I just Yeah, the know. turns definitely really make it difficult. Uh, some people have speculated, like, oh, maybe they could just, like, turn off factions that aren't in your field of view or, like, you don't uh, have it uncovered yet. But then that kind of takes away, like, these bigger sort of empires you encounter later in the game. Yeah. Which is kind of, like, one of the cool parts is, like, you, you finish up your, your smaller, you know, these few smaller enemies of yours, and then you're kind of, like, this bigger sort of empire. And then you find out, like, oh, wow, you know, the, the Germanic tribes have united into a giant confederation and are in the north there this entire time I've been down here doing this stuff. That's kind of fun. And I, I don't know, like, what they could do. I, I, could they be crunching some numbers on your turn? Like, yeah, maybe. But then you just said everything has to cascade down. So, like, decisions you make here will affect this person, this person, this person. So it, it, there's got to be a way. And these people, they're, it's kind of their job to figure out to be, like, creative, you know, problem solvers. You're saying they should assemble a creative solution? Yeah, like, they should definitely use some creative <laughs> ways and assemble something really, you know, yeah, exactly. And Follow they, their name. And they could Sega it. No, that, no, that, that uh, breaks down right there. It doesn't work anymore. No. All right. Uh, any, any final, you know what? Fucking, uh, I don't care. I'm going to say it. Why the hell won't you trade with me? It's a mutually beneficial <laughs> arrangement. Uh. No, actually, it isn't. I've been reading some speculation on why the diplomacy AI is so disgustingly bad. And apparently it's actually really clever. It doesn't want to give you any advantages. And so, like, if you have a resource that you'll be exporting, it's, it knows that you'll have that resource, and it will say, whoa, 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 you're going to get, like, 30% more money out of this trade agreement than I will. So, one, why would I want to give you free money? And two, why would I want to give you even more free money if I don't like you? Right, and, so, and that's all, that is fine. If it just told me that your share will be 300 and their share will be 100, then I would at least be okay. The AI is making a decision here that makes sense. But it never, that, that never became apparent. The other question that I've always had, maybe you can answer this. The, how the hell do the trade goods affect anything? I, it's pretty clear the more you have, the more income you get from trade. But when you, it, it makes a point of showing you which trade goods you're importing. Does yeah. that mean you're losing money? Or maybe it, maybe it only does that because you need those in order to win an economic victory. You need to have seven of the nine or something. Is that the only reason oh, it's showing that, you that? That might be the only reason because this game, they don't, like, no importing actually costs you anything. Yeah, I don't think so. It's only what you export that you make money on, and trade goods don't actually affect military or anything like they did in other games. So, like, you're not, you don't need them to build certain buildings or anything. You do the oh, you the do? wonder buildings. Not they're not called wonders, but you know the, the oh, like tier your five big culture, yeah, big culture buildings. Circus yeah, yeah. Maximus, Pantheon, and the Colosseum are the three that I can remember. Oh, and the um, the tier five sanitation building. I can't remember what it's called. It was like the crapatorium or something. It was it was. <laughs> I don't remember the name of it, but it's something like that. It was terrible. Uh, it comes off of the latrine line, if I'm remembering correctly. But those are the ones okay. that the Romans can build. Each of those requires a different... Like, the, the Crapatorium one, I think, required lead. And I think oh, that the Colosseum required marble. Not native to, like, your area. So it's either yeah. one you have to do that trade agreement and get that trade agreement, or you have to just conquer it. And usually, it's easier just to conquer yeah. everything. Yeah, and the game does mention like that there's a whole supply and demand system and then when you upgrade like a city that has wine it says you're producing 40 wine and when you upgrade you'll produce 80 wine but how does that affect anything if you're exporting more does the price go down and so you get less or maybe you can trade it with more people like I don't know what that means, and it doesn't ever explain it. I feel like they could flush that out. Like, if there was a separate panel just for trade routes, and it was showing that, you know, in uh, amongst all of our trade routes, there's this much wine. We're producing this much, so the price of wine is this. But, you know, if you get into a, a trade agreement with these other guys who are also producing wine, the price of wine in your area is going to drop because they're going to start importing their wine to you. So you're going to make less on it. But if they also are importing marble from you, then that might still make it worthwhile. Like, I feel like that system's going on in the background, but I can't get to it. There's, that's the only system I haven't been able to find any information on. 
Yeah, it's I don't I don't even know because I didn't think it existed. I thought it was just like a static amount. You Maybe get more it is. Of it, Maybe it is. More. I'm going off of the paragraph in the Civilopedia <laughs> that said that there's a supply and demand in there going on, uh, and that it's updated over time. Anyway, I think that's kind of the final the final things here. Uh, there was one thing in the Civilopedia that I found that was blatantly wrong, but other everything else seemed fairly accurate. Uh, it says that you can only recruit troops in a region where you have a building that allows you to recruit them, but it's province, not region. I don't know if that's a typo or if that was an old way of doing things. Hmm. I don't know. I haven't really played around with that. But it's once I figured that out, because I was like, I built like a cohort barracks or something in Rome, and I had an army that was mustering up uh, in whatever that northern province is, and yeah. I was like, why can I build Praetorians? I have an auxiliary barracks here. I don't have, and then it finally clicked. Everything is province wide, and I was like, "That's yeah. how. That's how culture spreads. That's so. When I upgrade my city and it gets five percent more wealth on every building, that's every building. Of course, it all. It all makes sense now. All right, um, we're going on a pretty probably long enough. <laughs> yeah, we can talk about. There's a lot to talk about. It's a big game in a lot of ways, and it's one of those. One of those games that's like so big, maybe it crumbled under its own weight in some ways. Like maybe they went too far, and it kind of like hurt them in the end when they really needed to like step up production and get the thing out the door. Yeah, and they just couldn't get in everything that they wanted to. Yeah, I think what I might do is not play it for a while because I don't want to burn out on the game when it's like meh. Like I still feel like I want to go and play it and explore it, but I know I'm gonna get frustrated by all those little things like the blockading of the friendlies or the the AI doing stupid stuff and just letting everything starve for no apparent reason, um, or going in a battle and just seeing some weird stuff going on in there. So I think I might just purposefully take a break and wait like a week or two and just keep track of the patch notes. And when the patch notes start to seem like they're fixing a lot of the problems that I'm having, and keep an eye on the modding forums. Because oh, yeah, modding the mods forums, are going crazy already. That's one thing we didn't mention. There's some pretty decent mods out there already, and in Man, I don't really want to give out the address because TWCenter.net is already struggling so hard. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what's interesting? And I don't know about the technology behind this. But when the Skyrim Nexus gets hit with a massive amount of traffic, it just fucking stops working. That yeah, shit breaks. goes down. When I go to the TW Center and I click something... It may take 30 to 40 to 50 or 60 seconds, but it will get me that page, goddammit. It will get it to me eventually. I can be... Yeah. Sh I have been expecting these things to just finally 404 on me after a fashion, but it will make it. I don't know what magical technology guru they have there that allows this to happen, because their, their, their web server is clearly way overworked, but it still gets it to me. I wonder if it's a bandwidth constriction rather than a processing constriction, and that's why it's able to do that. But that's really cool. Uh, but yeah. anyway, yeah, let's look at them. I have to give them a shout out. Like they did, they're doing a pretty good job. Like they got things organized. Like I went there the first day, things were a little bit disorganized, but now they have the proper like threads set up. Yep. You know, there's the, the modders. I have to give a big shout out to the Rome Two and just like uh, Total War modding community. Period. There's, there's not even any mod tools yet. People are just like using an unpacker and like going yeah. through the, the files that we can edit and figuring things out. Look at this. There's like five pages of mods that have been released already, like tweaking and, and, and just all these general like things that we're all having issues with. A lot of them have been fixed. My biggest thing was lethality in combat. I think the game is a little bit too fast paced and arcadey where like things die way too quick. And there's already mods fixing that stuff. And I think that's great. And 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 I'm you know you're probably right, Bridget. We should give this game maybe a week, maybe two. There's see what already the a lot. Up. Like I went through this whole list yesterday, and there's already like three mods that I now am interested in, and I'm opening up in new windows because I'm already looking for for things that uh, that are here. Uh, so so you've been using a couple of these. I have been using. What, which ones are you recommending so far? Uh, right now, I've been using uh, Yakursis. Yakusis? Yarkis? Yarkis? Yarkis Field Battles? Uh, no, Yarkis is combat. Uh, basically, he basic, oh, okay. uh, he just reduces the movement and lethality of units. And he's actually recently updated it, so now units try to stay in formation 
a little bit more because mm-hmm. he changed collision size and some of the mass stuff. I, I find myself liking that one. Uh, there's another big one, uh, Radius, I think his name yeah. is. He's releasing a lot, and his campaign stuff is pretty good. I like a lot of his uh, battle stuff. I'm not particularly fond on a few of his battle changes. One, he plays around with morale, and I don't think morale is the issue in the game right no. now. No, didn't seem like the issue to me. Yeah, it's lethality in some systems that aren't working. He improved shield. Like I think he said he improved shields and stuff like that. I think I want to check that out see how that works. Uh, maybe Testudo will actually work now. Yeah. Uh, Testudo will actually you know be good. But... Um, I think he also did Lethality, too, so maybe I'll check that out. Uh, but, you know, there's tons of different mods here. I recommend uh, maybe two turns per year if you want to kind of immerse yourself and enjoy like getting into your characters a little bit and, and building up those armies. Um, I think that might even be necessary. When you have a large empire, I've been hearing people say, you know, when you've got a big empire and you're high on that Imperium chart and you've got a ton of agents and generals out there, like dozens of them, they're dying like every other turn. You're just sitting there replacing them. And it felt really annoying every other turn to have that pop up like, hey, replace this guy. Like, I was, was going to do something. But then there was like this whole 40 second period where I had to watch things go across the screen. And then I got popped up like six times that I had to replace generals. What the hell was I going to do on this turn? I don't remember anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh. yeah but big shout out to the modding community like these guys are working with like some beta you know in d encryptor and like you know some tables and stuff like that and, and these like tools from like shogun 2 and stuff and they're making it work and a big shout out to those teams and you know what uh ca has kind of stepped up in in that way and they've released sort of the databases to them so uh actually in the total war modding community thread or whatever there's like the guy one of the creative assembly people has released the databases so that they can like easily decode them or something along those lines i'm not too sure of the specifics so being you know, a big shout out to creative assembly for kind of actually you know saying okay these guys can really do a lot more work than we can in a short period of time yeah because i heard and, that the uh that um shogun was a lot weaker on the mod support it was but that was because of um Things like a lack of an actual way to change the map and stuff like that. And uh, so, like, big projects like, you know, the, the, the Warhammer mod from the Medieval third 2, age, yeah. the Third Age mod, you know, those really big sort of overhauls never really made it that's to, too bad. You know, I Empire. Hope, I hope that Shogun. Rome gets some tools like that released. Yeah, and that's what I would love to see is, like, Rome, the original Rome spawns so much, like, so many different, like, mods and things and craziness. And I hope that this is sort of like another, like, Rome. I think this, that's what we're all hoping for, another Rome to come out and really just, like, give us a new game to give, put a bunch of hours into. And then, like, we can look forward to a good community where, you know, we'll have, like, crazy things like maybe another Third Age mod or something silly like that. Or, like, another Europa Barbaratum. And right now, it, we're not sure. It's a little bit up in the, up in the air. And... You know, it's, we're going to have to wait and see. And it sucks that I'm going to have to wait and see for a game I just paid $60 for. Huh. Yarkey's yeah. released a new one called the Field Battles for Minor Settlements. There was already an option in the game that was disabled that has a chance of field battles happening instead of siege battles when a minor settlement is attacked. So they actually, like, oh, sort of they're going out into the field and, and fighting. And it's, well, you, can, you can adjust the percentage chance from 25, 50, 75, or 100 chance. That's interesting. That one of the biggest AI problems is on those small settlement battles. They, where they seem kind to of only have one themselves. path. They don't know how to get, like, how to come in from multiple directions. They only, like, I've had the same settlement layout a couple of times, and they always go the same path. And it goes past that ridge that I can just set up my missile units on, and they just sit there constantly getting killed by my <laughs> missile units while the rest of my units stop them. Yeah, the yeah, ads, like, they. I remember really, like, day one or day two before the big patch on friday or whatever they were literally just running towards the point they were running they weren't even stopping to fight me so my men would just like kill them as they ran by yeah it was i was just like what how does this get through how does any qa department allow this like what that's why i'm convinced that it's not the qa department they identified these problems and released it anyway that's that's my that's that's how i'm convinced anyway um the the final thing, let's, we're talking about walls. The last thing, because there's been people saying, like, the lack of walls is destroying this game! Rawr! What are your thoughts on, on the lack of walls on everything, on all the sort of minor settlements? 
I don't mind it. I don't I mean, mind it uh, either, honestly. I, I think what you said before, it breaks up the monotony of constantly having to siege things. Although, <sighs> burning down a door on a stone <laughs> city wall. <sighs> That's so silly. That is so ridiculous that I don't even siege those. I just let it wait it out until they attack me because I don't even want to see that happen. I haven't even gone any, like, onagers or anything, because I... Oh, that just... It, they must... That, that, again, just screams we had to release this today, and this is the only way we could make this work the way we wanted it to work. But, damn. That's annoying. But I don't mind having to... Like, it makes sense. If you leave a settlement unguarded, somebody can come in and take that shit out. I like that the garrisons are built in. I think that's way better than the very confusing system in, like, the older Romes where, like, some units could be considered garrisons and therefore you didn't have to pay their upkeep and they would be slightly different colors when you actually garrison oh, an yeah, army yeah. in there. Like, the fact that the garrison is a completely separate and constant presence and dependent on the development of the city... And the more military buildings you have there, the better quality the garrison is. I love that. Absolutely love that. That whole system works beautifully. And then the garrison is enough to usually, on a developed city, to push away anything short of at least a half stack of solid, you know, decent troops. So, I like that a lot. And then if you just keep even a, even a quarter stack of solid, you know, legionaries, or if it was before then, if you've got, like... Uh, Principe, uh, then it seems to me that's enough. That quarter stack plus the garrison will be enough to deal with any threat except for a major force, like a full stack. And if a full stack comes in, you're, you're going to want a full army there to defend it anyway. So I, I really like that system. I know we, did, we didn't actually really talk about that aspect of it, so I wanted to get that in there. But now we should probably just say goodbye. <laughs> yeah, you could talk forever. We could but. totally talk forever, me especially. So, um, if you if you enjoyed this discussion, we'll talk more about stuff like this next week. Uh, is uh, the General Gaming Show again every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time uh, is when we start, and then we end when we end. Although we usually try to do about one hour shows, but I've been wanting to talk about this game for basically forever. So. Um, <laughs> I am Bridger. The Sound Strategy Network on YouTube is how you can get a hold of uh, past shows. We did a bunch of shows. We did one on uh, like free-to-play games. We did another one on um, uh, Bioshock Infinite. That was our first uh, show, I think, was the Bioshock Infinite show. I think it was the Skyrim one, wasn't it? Oh, we did the Skyrim mods. That's yeah, right. Skyrim that, was mods. The, that was the good one. After uh, this, I think what I'm going to do is go play some Civ Five and show off the set mods uh, as well as the expansion to Great here. He's been talking about thinking about picking up the expansion. So I'll show them what the uh, the advantages of picking it up are. Because I really like the uh, Civ 5 expansion. And they just dropped uh, 3.4 for the Communitas expansion pack last week. And they've had a couple of bug fix updates since then. It's still in beta, but I definitely want to give that a shot. So, with all that having been said, I am Bridger. Signing off, ladies and gentlemen. You'll see more Rome streamed from me maybe in a couple weeks when we've had a couple of patches... I don't want to burn out on it when it's not at its best, and I know it will get better over time. So, for uh, for me, I'm out. Thank you very much for coming on, great. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. All right, let's do this. I feel like I could talk about Rome forever. I know, right? It's I just gotta... so good. Like.